Welcome to the Maine State Archives. The crown jewel of the Maine State Archives collections are housed in about this area, and they represent as broad a holding of Civil War records of any state, north or south. We have hundreds of thousands of documents here at the Maine State Archives relating to the Civil War. It's not the volume of the documents so much that is of importance to the nation, it's the breadth of what the information contained in those documents represents because it, it's across the spectrum of our society. Yes, there are military documents, but the administration of the war rested with the northern governors in particular in the Union effort, and all of the information, all of the questions, all of the decisions that came in uh, from Maine at the time of the Civil War were, were made by the governor and by the adjutant general. And they kept the records pertaining to those decisions, in part because Maine then as now was very short on money and before these public servants could spend a dime they wanted to know that they could account for it not just today but tomorrow and on into what is now the future. Before the start of the Maine State Archives in, in 1965 a lot of the documents were housed actually by Maine's Department of Defense and they were in unused stables at Camp Keys. They were dry obviously and they were secure but they weren't kept in archival conditions. The letters that we see today from, from the military officers, from the wives, from the mothers, from the fathers coming in, from businessmen asking for contracts, uh, the fact that the, the governor and the adjutant general took special care of them then, we have them today in as close to pristine condition as we can possibly have them. These house the muster rolls, the monthly returns and the mustering in and mustering out rolls for the regiments that served from Maine during the Civil War. And there are about 14,700 of these that we have in hand, all of which have now been digitized and scanned so that the information that, uh, contained in them is available to a broader public. When you mustered in, uh, you, would, you would enlist and you would be attached to a, a company. And early in the war, this would be a local company somewhere, some town in Maine. For example, uh, the city of Bangor had a, a state company of guards and they became uh, Company A of the Coast Guards. Interesting there because uh, one of the enlistees is a fellow who might be familiar to uh, history bus. The top signature on this enlistment page belongs to H. Hamlin, who is Hannibal Hamlin, who was Abraham Lincoln's vice president during his first term. Hamlin at the time was 53 when he enlisted and he was living in Bangor. He became, interestingly enough, uh, the only sitting vice president ever to be called to active duty in a time of war. And that happened in 1864 when Hamlin found out that he was no longer going to be Abraham Lincoln's vice presidential candidate. That honor had gone on to Andrew Johnson from Tennessee, and Hamlin was stuck in Washington with nothing to do in the summer of 1864. And the New Hampshire Artillery Battery that had been serving at Fort McClary in Kittery, Maine, uh, was called forth uh, to Washington to help in the perimeter defense of the city. And the Maine Coast Guard Company A was uh, asked by the governor to go down to Fort McClary in Kittery from Bangor and the Bangor area. And Hannibal Hamlin decided, what the heck? Uh, and he and about 69 other uh, Maine men uh, took active duty and they served on the coast of Maine in Fort McClary in Kittery, Maine for the summer of 1864. When his 90 day service was up, he was mustered out and he, was, uh, he returned to Bangor for a little while and then he engaged in a uh, little bit of election campaigning uh, for his former boss, Abraham Lincoln and he returned to Washington uh, in September and October of 1864 prior to the national election. He had never met Lincoln uh, before being selected in, in 1860 and they actually um, met in Chicago after the Republican convention and Hamlin had a role early in the administration and was advising Lincoln on what to do. Politically he understood the decision because they wanted uh, a, a reach out to uh, the border states and to southern, some of the southern sympathizers and they thought that Andrew Johnson would make a better candidate. 
Hamlin eventually went back to the Senate. He had a great career, uh, but at, at the age of 54, even then, their life expectancy and their political life expectancy wasn't wasn't intended or ever expected to be you know, beyond the age of 60 or 70. So he was pretty well situated, and while it might have stung at the time, I, <laughs> I think it turned out all right for him. But it was sort of interesting, um, the extraordinary things that came out of such ordinary people. For example, Joseph Wilson, he's 24 years old. He's a farmer in Belfast, Maine. Uh, still very close to his parents. And he goes into the 4th Maine Regiment. They go to the front. Uh, they survive a measles scare. He, he gets vaccinated before he goes to the front, which in itself was novel at the time. He's not long in Washington where he gets assigned to the Aeronautics Corps, an outfit being run by a guy by the name of Thaddeus Lowe. And he had no idea what it was. But Wilson was a pretty smart guy, and he knew how to use a telegraph. And apparently he wasn't afraid of heights because the Aeronautic Corps was the first time that an army used a balloon. They inflated a balloon with a basket beneath it. They tethered the balloon to the ground, and then they sent up, in this case, Joe Wilson, so that he was about 1,000 feet above the ground looking down upon the Confederate Army and all of its movements. And then he would turn around and he would telegraph to the, to the Union forces on the ground where the Confederates were going and in what strength. So for the first time, beginning at the Battle of Arlington, the Union artillery could fire at the Confederate Army and have a reasonable chance of hitting it without ever seeing them. And Wilson writes home to his mother that occasionally the few shells will come up from the rebels, but that he had been safe. Well, at the same time, he was getting a perspective on the war that nobody had had before. Some experts might suggest that the Civil War was lost in a place far from the city of Washington or the city of Richmond. That it was actually lost at the mouth of the Savannah River in a place called Fort Pulaski, which had been a federal institution. The fort had been built at a cost of about a million dollars and would serve as the, the sentry on the Savannah River that would allow traffic uh, of southern goods to get out to the open sea. The 8th Maine Regiment under Captain William MacArthur, a um, guy out of Limington, Maine, was working the batteries, these Parrot rifles, two and a half miles downriver from Fort Pulaski. Parrot rifles, they were cannon that had rifling in them that allowed a projectile coming out of the muzzle of the cannon to work in a spiral, which meant that it would go farther and would, would be more accurate than anything that they had used before. And the Union Army had access to these Parrot rifles. The Union troops had sent notice to Charles Olmsted, the commander of Fort Pulaski, that uh, we're going to bombard you and uh, we really think you ought to give up. And finally, in April of 1862, northern troops began bombarding Fort Pulaski. And the amazing thing was, they could hit everything they were aiming at from a distance that lay outside the ability of the Confederates to land a telling blow in return. But the closer they got to the magazine, the more quickly Commander Olmsted was able to fly the flag of surrender and give Fort Pulaski over to the Union and, in effect, inform Robert E. Lee that the blockade of southern ports was going to work because the Union had technology that was going to overcome anything the Confederates could do to answer it. They couldn't counter the Parrot rifle that the Union Army had. We hope to be doing a lot of digitizing and scanning of the correspondence because it contains a lot of genealogical information that will be of interest to families. A lot of the families who did not return are the soldiers who, to Maine, but uh, whose family members would now like to know, what did their great-great-grandfather do during the war? We look at this collection as being of infinite value in shedding light on not just Maine's past, but Maine's uh, present and perhaps looking at Maine's future.